Castro. Visit Political Analysis Archives at ProgressiveRadioNetwork.com slash political dash analysis. Political Analysis, a groundbreaking look at the world. You are listening to Progressive Radio Network. Live from New York City, it's the Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. This is the Empowerment Hour. Today, however, no guest, no in-depth investigative reporting. Instead, all about health and healing, some about the environment, And I'm going to have two issues today. Both I thought would be appropriate because they're just not being discussed in the mainstream media at all. And I'll give you those in a few moments. Then I'd like for you to call in and address those. Then the rest of the program is open for you to call in after that and share your thoughts, questions, ideas on any topic we discuss. Let's begin. First up, we're all stressed Even good things cause stress, but there's two types of stress. There's the good stress, uh, like uh, meeting someone that we like to be with, uh, looking forward to a vacation, even anticipating a a movie that we want to see, um, or reading a good book, going to the beach, going on a vacation. All these things stress us. Playing sports, that stresses us, but in a good way. And good hormones are secreted because of that. Then there's bad stress, or what Hans Selye coined distress. That's an entirely different phenomena. Most of that comes from our conditioned past, not from the moment we're in, where we overreact or inappropriately respond to something, some stimulus, a word, a statement, a gesture. And then all this bent up Anger comes flowing out, either in something we say, something we do, something we write. And then later we try to walk it back. Sometimes if our egos are strong, we're non-apologetic. At other times, if we fear losing something, a job, a loved one, a friendship, uh, someone else's respect, then we apologize. And here's the key. Do we ever return there again, or is that just a way of getting someone to say, okay, I'll give you another chance, and then we do it again and again and again? Here's what we have to understand. Anytime you have a repeating pattern of behavior, it's not going to change. Hence, don't expect the person to change or the circumstance to change. All that's going to happen is you're going to keep adapting to the person's toxic distress and how they're responding to you, and it's going to be a very toxic circumstance, whether it's in work or play, friends or not. This is the latest on this. This is from Brain Behavior and Immunity, and here's what it says. I'll quote this. This was done at the University of California, San Francisco. Merely anticipating distress is aging us. Now, I think all of us have seen people who were under distress, and do you see how old they get? Look at the President of the United States. Look how they go into office looking one age, and four years or eight years later, they look a whole lot older. And biochemically, they're a lot older. Let me uh, report this. It says, and I'll quote this, in addition to the negative effect that experiencing stress has on telomeres, and by the way, telomeres are the caps on chromosomes, and the longer they are and the less they they uh, replicate the better the longer you live the quicker you replicate a cell replace a cell turnover cell and the shorter they are the quicker towards aging and death you are so when you're exercising and you're happy and you're living a quality life you're eating really right you're conscious of the choices you make your telomeres stay long in fact like alcarnosine 
and resveratrol and alpha-lipoic acid and glycine, these all are nutrients that can lengthen the, the telomere and hence allow us to live a longer life. But rarely do we do that. In fact, vegans don't get L-carnosine. That's why so many vegans, though they don't suffer from most of the diseases of meat eaters, a lot of them could be living a lot longer life if they had uh, carnosine in supplement form, about 2,000 milligrams a day. In any case, here's what this says. If you anticipate a stressful event, uh, that's going to shorten your lifespan. And, quote, the research included uh, lots of women, half of whom were caregivers of relatives with dementia. And they found that when anticipating stressful tasks, uh, that these people underwent a reduction in telomere length. And one of the things we've said many times on this program is that right now we're facing a virtual pandemic of age-related illnesses in our society. There was a time when I was growing up where if you reached the age of 60, you were considered old. 65 and you died, people said you had a good long life. It was rare that people in my community lived longer for a simple reason. Everyone smoked. Two to three packs a day was not uncommon. Everyone. Everyone drank. Not to get drunk, but social drinking was absolutely common. Everyone drank coffee. There was never a meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, where they didn't finish it with a cigarette and coffee where I grew up. And everyone had to have a dessert at the end of dinner, which was always a sugary dessert, pie or cake. No one exercised. When you were in your 30s and you were exercising, people would ask you why. And the only time most of the people over the age of 25 exercised when they would be on a softball team in the summertime. And that was it. So it was completely normal for people to look much older than what they actually were. So when they hit 60, biologically, because they had prematurely aged their system, they were 120. So it was time for them to die, biologically. And forget about trying to convince anyone of doing anything that would cause them to change any habit. No one, I mean no one, ever changed a single bad thing where I was growing up. No one. I remember once my buddy, his mother suffered from diabetes, and then it was called sugar diabetes. I will never forget the day I was speaking with her, and uh, her legs were all swollen, and she had bandages on the legs, and she had ulceration on the, on the legs, and uh, she couldn't put a shoe on because her feet were so swollen, and they had amputated one toe on each foot, and yet she's sitting there, and as she's speaking to me, she keeps reaching in and taking candy out of this dish. And she was about 50 pounds overweight. And I said to her, I said, Miss Bartlett, do you think that, that what you're eating, oh, no, 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 has nothing to do with it. You know, it uh, and that was the belief. So imagine my frustration of never being able to positively influence any friends or family members in my entire life. Not one. Not one. And it wasn't because of this kind of fatalistic West Virginia attitude towards life. It was everywhere. Now, I can then appreciate the frustration many of you have gone through when you've seen a better way and can't convince anyone of the rightness of that. In any case, just imagine now that you are 50 and your parents are 70 or 80, and you thought at this age you could start to have more time, quality time to yourself and your loved one, but now you've got to spend your time with a dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or ALS or some other condition in your parents. And needless to say, we have a moral responsibility to our, our parents and family to take care of them, especially now that Insurance is not going to pay for it. So who's supposed to feed them every day? What happens when they have Alzheimer's and they can't brush their hair? They can't feed. You have to literally put the fork of food in their mouth because they've lost the ability to know that a fork goes in food and in their mouth. They can't tie their shoes. You can't leave them alone. 
Imagine the anticipation of a day where you and your needs are not in that day at all. And let's say you have a family situation where you are the designated person to take care of mom or dad or both. And the others, well, we have still have kids and we, we, we have problems and we can't do it. You're probably going to knock 10 to 15 years off your own life. The anticipation of distress is going to be one of the biggest killers in the United States. I believe it will rival heart disease because it is associated with stroke, with heart attacks, with cancer, with dementia itself. I believe that we're going to have an entire generation of baby boomers themselves going into dementia because of how stressed they are, and stress creates the cortisol and the other stress hormones which prematurely ages. How many are we talking about right now? 90 million Americans are over the age of 47. Nine-o, and that's increasing. What are we doing about it nationally? Nothing. Nothing. So this year, over the next 12 months, I will be doing on a regular basis a lot of work, including two new documentaries, two new books coming out in the uh, summer and fall of how we can slow down and reverse the entire process, how we can de-stress ourselves, because I believe it's the single most important thing that baby boomers are going to uh, focus on. After all, my generation are the best educated generation in history, older generation, and we're not about to act like our parents and grandparents that because we're 50 or 60 or 40 or 70 that we have to assume that our diseases and death are inevitable. I don't believe they are. I believe also we have the science on our side now that we can add 20 years onto any person's life expectancy, 20 years right now, if we, we simply do what's right. So just understand that if you are stressed and you're distressed and you anticipate each day what you're going to be diminished in because of this, my suggestion, my suggestion is this. Take time to be in nature. Here are five things you can do that can distress you. Get a pet, a bird, a cat, a dog. If you're in the country, a horse, a lamb. Something that can love you unconditionally, no matter what you look like, no matter what you're feeling, they're going to be there to bond with every single day, all day. That's one. Secondly, go for a walk. Walking stimulates stress-reducing hormones called endorphins, and that's a good thing. It can also flush a lot of the toxic lymph out of your body. That's good, too. It can speed up detoxification of your liver. That's good. Number three, stop personalizing everything. Nobody woke up today to try to make you feel bad about yourself. So depersonalize stress. Say, okay, I'm faced with some circumstances. At this moment in my life, I have to contend with what is the most productive, positive way I can deal with it without feeling that I'm overwhelmed. Because once you get into that, I'm overwhelmed, I can't handle it, then you're going to get angry. Because your anger is not going to result in anything positive. You're going to turn it in, and when you turn it in, you're going to implode. And lastly, meditation and prayer, journal writing and listening to music, going for a walk in nature, any of these things can help us realize how beautiful the world is and how many tools we have that we may not be using. Next up, honey fights super-resistant conditions naturally. This is from Anthony uh, Guccidari from Natural News. I'll quote this. As drug-resistant bacteria become a further concern to not only health-conscious individuals, but also health organizations worldwide, stronger drugs are often presented as the solution to mainstream health officials. However, research shows that honey, raw honey, could be a potent answer to drug-resistant bacteria like MRSA without harmful side effects. In fact, honey was traditionally used to fight infection up until around the 20th century. Around this time, honey was forgotten and predominantly replaced by penicillin, but is now regaining its former popularity as the world countries uh, become more conscious of the dangers of pharmaceutical drug use, which now kill more individuals per year than traffic accidents. 
Of course, it was the excess usage of pharmaceutical drugs that have in many cases spawned the resistant strains in the first place of these bacteria. And the same antibiotics that have now been linked to health conditions ranging from mental illness to metabolic syndrome. In the food supply, organic farms do not use antibiotics and have been found to harbor less of these dangerous conditions. New research is examining how honey can prevent and fight serious skin infections. Interesting, some information indicates that natural raw honey can even be more effective than antibiotics. The way in which honey fights infection has to do with the way the bacteria lives on your skin. After a skin injury, like a cut or a scrape, bacteria can penetrate the wound site and cause problems. A common type of strep, known as streptococcus pygnogenes, can actually result in wounds that simply refuse to heal. And there was a peer review article in Microbiology that says, quote, in lab test, just a bit of the honey kill off the majority of bacterial cells and cut down dramatically on the stubborn biofilm they formed. It could also be used to prevent wounds from becoming infected in the first place. I also believe if you used uh, ozone directly into those sores, you could destroy the biofilm and put honey on as well. That's the latest on health and nutrition. Now, I'm going to give two simple issues that I believe the American media has not addressed, and I would like for you to give us your feedback on these. The first is <clears throat> one out of every 10 Wall Street employees is a psychopath, so said researchers. This is from the Huffington Post from Alexander Eisler. Let me quote this. It says, one out of every 10 Wall Street employees is likely a clinical psychopath. This is according to journalist Sherry D. Convoy in an upcoming issue of a major magazine. In the general population, the rate is close to 1%. Quote, the, a financial psychopath can present as a perfectly well-rounded job candidate, CEO, manager, co-worker, and team member because their destructive characteristics are practically invisible. And uh, to be sure, typical psychopath's behavior runs the gauntlet. At the extreme end is Bateman, portrayed by uh, or Batman, portrayed by Christian Bell in the movie, no, excuse me, at Bateman, uh, American Psycho, as an investment banker who actually kills people and exhibits no remorse. When health professionals talk about psychopaths, they have a broader range of behavior in mind. A clinical psychopath is bright, gregarious, and charming. He lies easily and often and may have trouble feeling empathy for other people. He's probably also more willing to take dangerous risks, either because he doesn't understand the consequences or because he simply doesn't care. An appetite for risk can seem like a positive business trait on Wall Street, where big gambles sometimes lead to big rewards. But for the people that they're talking about, the outcomes matter less than the gambles themselves and the chemical rush of serotonin and endorphins that accompanies them. This is the hardly, hardly the first time that mental illness has been equated with a certain capacity for professional success. My thoughts on this are simple. I believe that every single president of the United States, almost all politicians, and most of the people in the media are psychopaths. All right? I believe most corporate CEOs are psychopaths. I believe most of the people on the board of directors are psychopaths. I believe almost all dynamic, aggressive life energies are psychopaths. But they're also charming well-spoken, very articulate, and they're as smooth as eels going through Vaseline. They can look you right in the eye and lie to you about what they're going to do, turn right around and do the opposite, and the clever thing about them is they're so engaging that you want them to be nice. You want to believe that what they have in, in store for you is in your best interest, even when they're working completely against you. I never will forget when I was watching um, the debates for the presidential election, the last one, and there was Hillary Clinton in, uh, in Ohio in a debate, I think it was Cleveland, it was in the summertime, talking about how, you know, she, you know, is against NAFTA, but only Dennis Kucinich said that he would ban completely NAFTA, GATT, the World Trade Organization. Of course, he is a true progressive and a hero to many. And yet it was Hillary Clinton and her husband who were the biggest promoters of NAFTA. So here you're in front of a group of 
blue-collar, mainly unionists, talking about what you're going to do for them, and yet the very thing that was done was to take away their jobs and put them in Mexico. Over a million, 600,000 American workers lost their job because of NAFTA. So to go back in front of those people and say you're for them, that's the power of a psychopath. They can say anything, and you want to believe them. So here's the question. Why is it that in America we have such a difficult time disengaging from the illusion of what we want to believe and deal with the reality of what is in front of us? In all circumstances, the illusion that what we're about to eat is good for us when we know it's not. The illusion that what we're buying we need at Christmas time when we don't. The illusion we should go to these special Ivy League schools because it's going to give us a, a, a leg up in life when it doesn't. The illusion we should start pushing our kids in, at two years of age to learn some language and get them into special schools, what's called redshirting, when at the end of the day, none of this prepares a kid for the world they live in. The illusion if we teach all of our kids how to take tests, they'll take a test, won't know a damn thing about the material they just tested out on, even if they get an A on it. The illusion that our curriculums are good when they're terrible and our teaching is quality when it stinks. The illusion that the banks have our interests at stake when they don't. The illusion <clears throat> that we care about our environment when we don't. The illusion that we're loving and kind people when we have 12 million children that are going hungry each day and 150 million Americans who are near, at, or slightly above the poverty level when 40 million Americans have been thrown out of their house, not a single march or demonstration by all these groups to stop it. So what are we? Are we this remarkable people? Some are, clearly. But we need the illusion that we're more than what we are. And the illusion that our vote for Democrat or Republican makes a difference. It does not. If it did, we wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't have suffering. We wouldn't have poverty. We would have a good educational system, and if someone got sick, they'd be helped in this country. None of that is happening. So my question to you is, are we a nation of psychopaths unwilling to acknowledge this part of our dark side? And if we cannot acknowledge our problem, can we change it? That is my question to you. I'd like your response. 888-874-4888. 888 like to hear what you have to say on this. And one other thing that has concerned me. I have watched every president. I have watched all these different members of Congress parading up before the American public and saying how we must support Israel in destroying Iran because of its nuclear capabilities. And I have not seen these people go to Iran and look at all the reports. When you do, you see that there is absolutely no proof that they are actually constructing a nuclear facility. And then I say, surely our country and the media and the American public and politicians cannot be replaying the weapons of mass destruction, lies and deceit, or a Gulf of Tonkin false flag. We can't do this again, can we? Clearly we can. Not just in 2003. That's it's only nine years ago. We can't be that gullible. And that's exactly what we're doing. Why? Why? Everything we've done in the Middle East is wrong if we want peace. Hence, this is from Alternet, Con Hallinan, Foreign Policy in Focus. Quote, why nations start dumb wars, and is Israel setting the stage for tragedy? I believe it is. I believe it now it's inevitable because the media is not challenging the president, other politicians not challenging other politicians of the president, and the American public is acting, oh good, another war. Are we going to give him another Nobel Prize for peace if he starts another war? This has gotten insane. Let me quote this. And again, I want your thoughts on this. Wars are fought because some people decide it is in their interest to fight them. World War I was not started over the Archduke Ferdinand's assassination, nor was it triggered by the alliance system. An accident may set the stage for war, but no one keeps shooting unless they think it's a good idea. The Great War started because the countries involved decided they would profit by it, delusional as that conclusion was. It is useful to keep this in mind when trying to figure out whether the United States or Israel will go to war with Iran. In short, 
what are the interests of the propagandists, and are they important enough for those nations to take the fatal step into the chaos of battle? According to Prime Minister uh, Israel, Prime Minister ne uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Iran is building nuclear weapons that pose an existential threat to Israel. But virtually no one believes this, including the bulk of Tel Aviv's military and intelligence communities. As former Israeli chief of staff Dan Hallett's recently said, quote, Iran is not an existential threat to Israel. There's no evidence that Iran is building a bomb, and all of facilities are currently under 24-hour UN inspection regimes. In fact, the head of Mossad, the head of the armed forces, have all said the same thing in Israel. So here on the one hand, you have the top military people who certainly have the intelligence to know, and they're saying no. So from a strictly security perspective, Israel has little reason to go to war with Iran. But Israel does have an interest in keeping the Middle East a fragmented place. Riven by sectarian divisions and dominated by authoritarian governments, the feudal monopolies, if there is one lesson Israel has learned from its former British overlords, it is divide and conquer. Among its closest allies were the former dictatorships in Egypt and Tunisia. It now finds itself on the same page as the reactionary monarchies of the Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar, and Oman. Iran is not a military threat to Israel, but it is a political problem. Tel Aviv sees to Iran's fierce nationalism and independence from the West as a wild card. Iran is also allied with Israel's major regional enemy, Syria, with which Israel is still officially at war, as well as Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza, then the Shiite-dominated government in Iraq. In the Netanyahu government's analysis, beating up on Iran would weaken Israel's local enemies a little, at little cost. Tel Aviv's scenario features a shock and awe attack, followed by a UN-mandated ceasefire, with a maximum of 500 Israeli casualties. The Iranians have little capacity to strike back, and if they did attack Israel civilian centers or tried to close the Straits of Hormuz, it would bring in the Americans. Of course, that rose-colored scenario is little more than a wishful thinking. Iran is not likely to agree to a rapid ceasefire. It fought for eight long years against Iraq, and war has a habit of derailing the best laid plans. A war between Israel and Iran would be a long and bloody war and might well spread into the entire region. Iran's leaders dispense a lot of bombast about punishing Israel if it attacks, but in the short run, there is not a lot they can do, particularly given the red lines Washington has drawn. The Iranian Air Force is obsolete, the, and the Israelis, the Israelis have the technology to blank out most of Iran's radar and anti-aircraft sites. Iran could do little to stop Tel Aviv's mixture of air attacks, submarine-fired cruise missiles, and Jericho ballistic missiles. For all of its talk about how all options are on the table, the Obama administration appears to not want the war. But with the 2012 election looming, could Washington remain on the sidelines? Polls indicate that Americans would not look with favor on a new Middle East war. But a united front of Republicans, neoconservatives, and the American-Israeli Political Action Committee is pressing for a confrontation with Iran. Israeli sources suggest that Netanyahu may calculate that an election season Israeli attack might force the Obama administration to back a war or damage Obama's re-election chances. It's no secret there's no love lost between the two leaders. But the United States also has a dog in this fight. American hostility to Iran dates back to Iran's seizure of its oil assets from Britain in 1951. The CIA helped overthrow the democratically elected Iranian government in 1953 and install the murderous dictatorial Shah of Iran. The United States also backed Saddam Hussein's war on Iran, has had a long-standing antagonistic relation with Syria, and will not let Hezbollah or Hamas alone. Tel Aviv's local enemies are Washington's local enemies. When the Gulf monarchs formed the GCC in 1981, its primary purpose was to oppose Iranian influence in the Middle East. Using religious division as a wedge, the GCC has encouraged Sunni fundamentalists to fight Shiites in Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria, and largely block the spread of the Arab Spring to its own turf. When Shiites in Bahrain began protesting over a lack of democracy and low wages, the GCC invaded and crushed the demonstrations. The GCC does not see eye to eye with the United States and Israel on Palestinians, although it is careful not to annoy Washington and Tel Aviv. 
The European Union has joined the sanctions, although France and Germany have explicitly rejected the use of force. In brief, it isn't all about oil and gas, but a whole lot of it is. And as counterpunches Alexander Coburn points out, oil companies would like to see production cut and prices rise. Again, let me explain that. The best thing that can happen to oil companies in America, war. If there's a war with Iran, do you realize how much profit they will make? They will make more money in one year than they will have all the otherwise made in the last 10 years combined. So let's hear it for Shell and ExxonMobil and all their lobbyists who are demanding behind the scenes and through their political action groups war. And so they'll beat the drums of war because when we go to war and think it's a great idea because we're defending democracy, A, we're not defending democracy. The one time Iran had complete democracy, we, the United States, sabotaged it and put a murder in their place. It's about $300 a barrel for oil, $15 to $20 for a gallon of gas. And yet at no time once it start will it be able to be stopped for a long time. So just think of that. Think of the dynamics that are about to happen. And yet the American media is reporting on this without challenging it. I didn't expect them to have the courage, the intellect, or the spirit to say, why are you warmongering? And look at the consequences in the history that I just gave you. Instead, they'll talk about, well, the president's aligned or this and that. It's all nonsense. I'm Gary Nall. Your thoughts on these two issues, 888-874-4888, 888-874-4888. Back in a moment with your call. Now, if you'd like to share your thoughts on either of those two issues, please do, 888-874-4888. After I take a few calls on that, I'll open it up to any other issue that you'd like to address on health or anything else. But just coming in the studio just now is Luann Panessi. Hi, Luann. Hi, Gary. Luann, you have been in there uh, and because Elizabeth couldn't be here today, and you were looking at the mail. What do we have in our mailbag? Whoa. <clears throat> well, <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> we'll give it, we'll give it a couple of minutes. Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, we, have, we had a lot of emails. Um, one of the greatest things that we're noticing is the fact that um, people that have been watching your DVDs, your documentaries, listening to the show, they're asking deeper questions. And one of the questions that comes up is that uh, we're overwhelmed right now with a lot of input from the right. And we hear a little bit about what's going on on the left. The question that I think is nagging people is, of the many issues, what is the most important thing that seems to be missing from the left at this time? Hmm. I believe it's two things. These are not the only things by any means. One, I believe that the left has been fractured that those who are the true liberal Democrats in the, in the, the mold of an FDR that cared about uh, the people and its institutions have been marginalized because the corporate Democrats have been in power since Clinton and they haven't had a real voice. If you look at the over 1,600 political appointments, the people to run different um, committees and to run different oversight groups and agencies, you have zero progressive Democrats. None. And hence, now when you have a progressive idea, the people in the media frequently call you a, a radical liberal. When you're not radical at all, you're simply giving a, an answer to a solution that is not official Democrat. Now, we have two realities in the United States today. In education, in medicine, in nursing, your background, in finance, uh, in, in agriculture, in in city planning, in rural development, I don't care what area you go into, you have two realities, official truths, and hence everything must come from an official. So if you say you as a nurse were able to heal a patient from hepatitis B or C using ozone and nutrition and diet, 
instead of talking with the patient, looking at the medical records, looking at the original uh, diagnostic diagnosis and talking with that physician, and using that as your starting point, they would immediately contact a governmental agency and say, I, I, this woman says she was able to help a person with hepatitis using these therapies. Well, those therapies are not recognized. They're not official recognized. So it can't be true. So everyone in alternative health care, that means about 88,000 Americans. That means all of your mixed holistic chiropractors who are magnificent at healing and helping people. They're one of the first vanguards of alternative medicine. All the holistic n- nurses dentist, uh, dietitians, and homeopaths, massage, medical massage therapists, and medical doctors, all of those are completely denied any legitimacy whatsoever. I don't care if they have the best degrees come from the best background. They must be, must be completely neglected. Now, if they become very popular and um, they develop a following, now it's not just a matter of denying them, it's attacking them. They'll end up on a quack, quack list. And one of the most corrupt organizations in the world, in my opinion, as far as editorial, is Wikipedia. Everyone I know who's doing anything important, and I've verified it, oh, I was on there as a quack. You try to get anything changed and see how impossible it is. Okay? It's not legitimate. It's not transparent. The deck is stacked. And yet it's supposed to be... That is a major investigation I'm doing right now, and I'm going to expose them for what they are. But the moment you're on there, then someone see that they're they're a quack. Well, how do you know they're a quack? Did you go to their office? Did you look at the records? Oh, I don't have to. It's on the as if the internet is objective. Oh, the AMA as if the AMA, a criminal organization, has been found guilty. Now that doctor, Joey Whitaker, was never found guilty of anything. His patients love him. He's cured diabetes, cured heart disease, without surgery. He's on a quack list. Yet the American Medical Association was found guilty, and that guilt was upheld in the Supreme Court twice of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act, restraint of trade. That's a criminal offense. Yet why are they used as a standard, gold standard? You're going to tell me a pharmaceutical company that sells us a drug that was found guilty of killing 60,000 Americans with one drug, with knowledge of forethought. They knew with a malicious contempt for the truth that what they were going to do with Vioxx was going to increase heart attack and stroke, but they knew how much money they would make, and they actually calculated that for any lawsuit we lose, it will still mean we're more profitable. So we'll go ahead and include in the cost of doing the drug the cost of paying people who die because of the drug, and we're still more profitable. And you know something? They were right. 60,000 Americans died. They paid a $5.8 billion uh, fine. No one went to jail. No reputation was harmed. Now, that's not the first drug that they've killed people with. There are 100,000 who had heart attack and stroke. They have a whole history of drugs they've created that have hurt people. They've had thousands of lawsuits they've settled. And yet, officially, they're to be trusted. Officially, Goldman Sachs is to be respected on Wall Street. Officially, Citigroup is to be protected and given bailouts into the trillions of dollars, $2.3 trillion they're given secretly because they're an official institution. So they're corrupt at Citigroup. They're corrupt at Goldman Sachs. These are cesspools of pathological, psychopathic, and criminal behavior. Yet because they're official, they will never be touched. You will never see anyone in official position harmed or reputation destroyed as long as they stay within the circle of power. The media can produce lies like the New York Times, which should have ceased to do business after it promoted the war in Iraq because with Judith Miller banging the drums and the New York Times not doing its own homework on it, verifying that we did already, I had already denounced Judith Miller in the New York Times, that we knew for a fact that her source was a fraud. I said it on my show. But it didn't matter. I'm not official. She is the New York Times. Look at how many hundreds of thousands to a million or more Iraqi civilians have died because of the New York Times. Did anyone ever apologize? Did anyone ever take responsibility? No. How many times did they commit laws against uh, crimes against society, yet no one will punish them? In fact, we've already said we're going forward, not backwards. Could you imagine at the Nuremberg trials, the chief justice who was from the United States saying we're sorry to all the Jews and all the other people who have been harmed, the Russians, 40 million people killed in the Second World War. We're going forward, not looking back. So we're going to let all these people walk. Could you imagine the outrage? Could you imagine, and rightly so, 
But in the United States, we have millions of people who are injured or killed. They get away with that's a That's the benefit of anything being official. So, you name the institution, the official way of growing pro- produce, genetic engineering, the official way of teaching our kids how to be dumber than what you thought a brick would be, official curriculums that are utterly, mind-numbingly stupid, the official way to reward a teacher by getting a student to get a good grade on a test because you coached them, you, you tutored them, but what did they learn? Nothing. How can they apply what they learn in the world? They can't. So it's about getting a grade because the system rewards effort, not results. So every institution we have is based upon the illusion of a truth that is never universal, only personal to the guild, the group, the tribe, the union, the individuals in their circle a power. So anybody who now thinks for themselves, thinks independently, they're excluded. So the official left excludes all those who care about policies and putting them in practice. The official left wanted to boycott Walmart and boycott the Alex corporations and boycott these elections until good quality third-party candidates are brought forward. But they didn't have a form to say it on because they weren't the official left. And the same has been true on the right. So as a result, when they started condemning, when Keith Obman and Rachel Maddow and others on the official left began to condemn the Tea Party, calling them racist and rednecks and everything else, terrible uh, condemnation, I simply went out there for myself to see, was it true? Might have been true, right? So I went to 12 of their rallies, and I spent a whole day and interviewed hundreds in Philadelphia. Of hundreds of people I interviewed, they were all about the same thing. We're angry and we're here because of the waste of our tax dollars' money on the fraud of many of these bureaucracies, how they spend our money. And we don't believe that we should be paying higher taxes just to fund redundancy and corruption. And I agree with that. What reasonable person wouldn't? They didn't say they wanted all government destroyed. But certainly there's some governmental agencies that need to be completely taken to the ground and redone over again as a truly independent, like the FDA and the USDA, which is now controlled by Monsanto with Michael Taylor and promoting genetic engineering and tried to take away the safety of our food, the real safety of our food. So, and shouldn't we take down completely the U.S. Public Health Service, which is controlled by the pharmaceutical industry, and put in its place a real public health service that uses prevention? So you look carefully, and you speak carefully, and they're against wars. So I found two people that I would consider bigots and racist. I found 400 who were not, yet they were all destroyed on the left. You can't talk with them, don't have them on there. And the same thing they did with Ron Paul. They threw Ron Paul under the truck. Why? Because he has some positions that are offensive. I find uh, about 10 of his positions offensive. But I find 18 of his positions to be remarkably brilliant and courageous as no one else in politics has been for decades. He alone said in the CIA and FBI, many see right on that. We've become a police state, and they are the black uh, boot uh, people coming to enforce the official rules. We've become militarized. We've taken away our uh, habeas corpus and other constitutional rights. He said bring back America's rights and honor the Constitution, our Bill of Rights. He said, get out of all these foreign wars and close down a thousand military bases. That saves us a trillion dollars a year. He said we shouldn't be giving money to all these foreign governments so they can continue to suppress their own people, as we have done. We gave three billion dollars in one year to uh, Egypt, and they suppressed their people. And we supported Libya and Saudi Arabia, and we're giving money to China? Just stupid. And he doesn't believe we should be giving that money to them. He wants to get rid of the Federal Reserve and only allow the Treasury to print money and be held accountable and not print fiat currency. He is right. By any standard, he is right. Otherwise, you have a completely corrupt private institution that you never hear anyone saying, who actually is the largest shareholders in the Federal Reserve banks? He is challenging that. It was he and Bernie Sanders together that got the inclusion in the uh, audit inclusion in the uh, Dodd-Frank bill that allowed us to find out 
that the Fed had given $16 trillion at zero interest for junk uh, to corporations, foreign governments, foreign banks, but not a penny to the American people. So he wants that stopped. He wants freedom of choice in health care. He's against mandatory vaccination. He believes that you should be able to uh, eat your own food without someone coming and telling you that, you know, you're not meeting the safe standards of the genetic engineering. He's got 17 things to me that are better than anyone that's in office for the last 20 years. So wouldn't it make sense to take what you agree with in him and join together? And that's what we're doing. We're bringing together Ron Paul at his best and leaving his worst alone. Ralph Nader at his best and leaving his worst alone. Dennis Kucinich and Bernie Sanders and Rocky Anderson and Jill Stein, a wonderful, brilliant physician from Harvard, um, and bringing her best and leaving the worst alone. Bringing coalitions of independent thinkers together so you actually have the basis for the future of a third party that will bring together populist issues that will bring government to a status that actually serves the people, and that's what the left has missed. So it's, you've got 12 million young idealists who supported Paul. All of them have been backhanded and kicked in the teeth by the left. They have been denigrated as if somehow they're stupid, they're moronic. Until you condemn someone, go talk with them, and then show me what you've got that's better. All I see on the left is massive egos fighting one another, no conciliation, no cooperation, and as a result, no change. That's what I think is missing. Let's say hello, um, and thank you for that a question. Let's say hello to Kenny from Atlanta. Hi, Kenny, you're on. Yes, um, I got a question about uh, tricks to make. I think it's like a migraine um, medicine. And um, my girlfriend took it, and I'm curious as to what is like a much better alternative than to be taking that trip somewhere. Okay, what is, what is your question? Well, I'm I'm looking for an alternative to trip somewhere. I think that's the name of it. You're looking Actually, for an alternative have, to headache. Well, she had like migraines, and she took like. Okay, what is the cause of the migraine? What is the diagnosis? Um. What's, what's the diagnosis? What's the cause of it? What's the cause of it, having a headache? She thinks it's hormonal. She thinks has it been diagnosed. Have you ruled out the following? Have you ruled out allergies? Allergies are one of the most common reasons people have headaches, especially to sulfates. You get sulfates in wine. You get them in other, uh, you get them in balsamic vinegar. You get them in a lot of different foods, and especially foods that are being kept green longer. Uh, that's a big cause of headaches. Also in smoke foods, any food that's smoked, that's another cause. MSG is a cause, and it's a lot of food, including texturized proteins. That's why, unless I know what the protein texturized or the protein isolate is, I won't use it. And, and uh, even in a vegan restaurant here in Manhattan, when I saw it on the menu, I said, do you make it? Oh, no, we bring it in. Well, let me see a label. Oh, we don't have a label. So you're selling me something that you don't know just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy. And, well, I'm sure it is. How do you know? You're not going to know until someone gets home and has a headache and starts flushing that they used MSG in it and you didn't know. So check all soy protein isolates and see what the isolate is made from. Also, understand that dairy, especially cheese, has a particular amino acid that can cause headaches. And then you have to look at a, a gluten can cause headaches. So if you go on a completely raw diet for two weeks and juice eight times a day and keep yourself with lots of root vegetables, rutabaga, parsnips, uh, kohlrabi, uh, turnips, and squash, and then have beans black beans, navy beans, lentils, black-eyed uh, peas, and then have your salads and very little fruit except watermelon and lemon and see if after two weeks uh, using fever few and also non-flush niacin is niacinamide, high levels of vitamin C and quercetin, vitamin D3, and 100 milligrams B-complex, generally, for most people, that will help you with a headache. All right? All the best to you. 
Alan from Brooklyn. Your turn, Alan. Oh, hi, Gary, and thank you for taking my call. Um, on February 21st program, um, you mentioned something about, I don't have it exactly, uh, how you mentioned it, but it was an elect- some kind of an electronic pulse machine for neurological problems? Yes, what I said was that there was a new study that showed that electromagnetic therapy, where you uh, put a, a magnet that is pulsed to a particular frequency on a person's head, it was able to completely eliminate the depression in mild to moderate depression. There is now a new study being done, because I know the senior scientist working on it, who is doing it with a newer um, apparatus that ha- can help a whole wide range of conditions. And as these conditions are monitored, he's going to let me know, and I'll bring it to your attention, because it's non-toxic, and it's, I just think it's terrific, and I'm a big believer in magnetic therapy. Okay? Mark from New York, your final call, Mark. Yes, uh, I have a question uh if I had to choose between Tai Chi and uh, aerobic exercise, which would work best for a middle-aged, overweight ma- male? Well, the, the, both. Uh, the Tai Chi would allow you to meditate because it's really a reflective meditation. It's quiet. It's soft. It's slow. It allows you to increase balance, focus, breathing, and rhythm, uh, your rhythm in your movement. Um, but the aerobic is a crucial because it helps to change your metabolism, bring down your pulse, increase your liver detoxifying enzymes. It also helps to increase metabolism so that when you go to sleep at night, you're burning more calories. It will lower your body index of fat. It will help tighten your muscles, increase your production of natural male hormone, growth hormone, which will give you more muscle mass back. And it will create more serotonin. Uh, balance with endorphins so you're going to feel better. So all that comes from your aerobic. So I would suggest you do 45 minutes of aerobic and 15 minutes of Tai Chi. All the best to you. We're out of time. I want to thank you all for taking your time to tune in and share your thoughts. I'm Gary Nall. Have a nice day, everyone. Now let's say hello to Michael Rupert. Hi, Michael. You're on the air. Hi, Gary. How are you? Doing great, thank you. Um, we, we have a real mystery going on tonight. Uh, it's been confirmed by a number of press sources that there has been at least a fire and some small explosions uh, at, in the aorta of the world's oil supply, which is the, a complex of pipelines running between Abqaiq and Ras Tanura in Saudi Arabia. While Iran's claiming it's all blown up, which would be a devastating blow, and, and, and there are sources, sources confirming an explosion, um, uh, Saudi Arabia is denying anything happened, and this is uh, this is the the a order of the world's oil supply. We're going to talk about that tonight, and it's also going to be a show about the media. There's just been some great developments this week. Well, uh, keep this in mind. Uh, here's my thought: I don't believe that um, Iran would go after Israel. First, I believe they go after Saudi Arabia. Yeah, correct. Because if they go after Saudi Arabia, and they have the capacity, and they're near enough to go after Saudi Arabia, and they destroy the oil uh, capacity, not the oil supply, but the if they hit out the refineries and all, then what you have is you have the price of oil going out of the roof. They don't even have to close down the straits for that to happen. And then they go after anyone else. Now, remember, the United States has to realize that when there's a war against Iran, you've just united Iran and Iraq. What do you think this is going to do when Iraq has to side with Iran against Israel and the United States? How safe do you think those 100,000 private contractors, the embassy with its 15,000 staff, you're going to see massive, massive uh, effort against the American presence in Iraq. And and, and it's coming from all over the world now, Gary, in Pakistan, Afghanistan. Looks like there's a coalition forming. And China and Russia. Yeah, exactly. And and India. Yes. So where in the hell do you think that we're going to have anything representing intelligent thought when we allow some firebrand, radical, self-righteous, religious zealots led by Netanyahu, who's a complete uh, nut job, Get us into a war, also the president and those suck-ups of APAC, 
uh, can say, oh, we're 100% Israeli. No, you're not, because I'll show you 75% of the Israeli population who are against going into Iran. Exactly. And exactly. those are the peace movement. Why don't we ever have the peaceful Israelis shown at the White House? Because they are dominant. You have one of the strongest pro-peace movements in the world in Israel. You would never know it, would you? Nor would you ever see the President of the United States going into the Palestinian territories, showing the world's largest apartheid prison with over two million people living virtually as slaves. You won't see that because that's a picture that wouldn't jive them with our unbridled, complete support of the people. I want peace for everyone in the Middle East. I want peace for Israel. I want peace for Iran. But everything they're doing now is showing just what Bush did and Cheney did and Rumsfeld. The media is going to back it. The media are a bunch of clowns and fools and liars. They are complete psychopaths. Well, they're being shown, Gary, absolutely. The U.S., Israel, and Western media are being shown to be utter buffoons and three stooges in the eyes of the world right now. And that, that is why Iran is ascendant as a power in the region. It's, uh, it's increasingly flexing muscle. And it's very clear that, uh, that what's happening in the West is a result of sheer stupidity. Also, who do you think the most powerful man in Iraq is? Do you think it's Maliki, prime minister? Or do uh, you think it's Muktasadr, yeah. who is becoming the new Iman? After seven years, when he finishes his seventh year in Iran, in Qom, their religious capital, under the Iranian mullahs, to become the official spiritual leader of Iraq. It's definitely Muqtada al-Sadr, who uh, fought the U.S. Uh, Marines and the Army to a standstill in Fallujah twice with his two-million-man Mehdi Army. And he did is, he not tell his 300,000 men, go to ground, put down your arms, start, stop fighting Americans? And that was the cause for the... Uh, surge supposedly being a good thing, but it wasn't. It was because they stopped fighting mode. Now he's going to be back. I wonder what his position will be when we attack Iran and we start killing innocents as we have in the past. Imagine now this. Pakistan joins with Iraq. Yep, yep, yep. And Iran joins with Pakistan. And Iran, China supports Iran. Russia supports Iran. India supports Iran. Yeah, well, and now the, what you have, you and and plus Lebanon and uh, supports Iran, and you have uh, Syria supporting Iran. Gee whiz! Now what could possibly go wrong? Well, I don't think there's going to be any attack on Iran. I think that part of of, of World War Three is already lost and it's over. That chance is gone. I don't see any chance of that momentum coming back now, especially with Vladimir Putin just winning re-election uh, in Russia. Uh, and he's made his position vis-a-vis -vis Syria and Iran perfectly clear. I don't think there's going to be any attack now. I, I think Iran is really in the driver's seat in terms of momentum and inertia at the moment. I, I would believe you completely, but I have one caveat. Israel will do what it wants, and then that means that it will force the United States to come to its aid. And that means the United States that when engage, as it did when in Libya which is a war that should never have happened. Now you see why I predicted it was going to happen. You have hundreds of tribes fighting each other, and it's going to go on with civil wars forever. And what would happen is the U.N. would then be mandated to go in to have no-fly zones and do the bombing in Iran, as it did in Libya, with the United States supporting and leading that, and then watch all of those oil wells in Saudi Arabia catch on fire and when Saudi Arabia, the number one producer, and Iran, the number two producer, and then Iraq, the number three producer, can no longer produce oil, wonder how much Americans are going to feel at the pump. You're looking at 15 to $20 a gallon. The speculators will love it. Wall Street will love it. But the American people will go, ouch. And that's just the beginning of it. We're probably going to be doing that next week. Thank you a lot. We look forward to listening to your program now. Thanks.